Okay, everyone, welcome back from lunch. Um, welcome to the first of our afternoon uh, sessions. I think we'll agree we had a very productive agora um, this morning, and I hope that um, we can be as interactive uh, together this afternoon. We have three excellent speakers who I'll introduce in a moment. Um, we're going to do the same running order as we had for this morning's session, so I will start with a short uh, framing. I will then um, pass over to our three speakers, Peter Economides, uh, Thomas Fisher, and first of all, uh, Nikos Sidakis, um, who will each give an intervention, and then we'll make sure we leave uh, plenty of time for questions and discussion, um, as we did this morning. Um, if I press this button, excellent. Um, this morning, we started a conversation that I think will continue for the two days, which is the core question about the role of foundations in the crisis. Um, this session, there, there's, there's very much a, a sub-question as well, which is around communications. Um, in particular, two, two issues. Uh, one, that as foundations have stepped up to... Go on. It did, I just did skip one. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so two communications points. Uh, the first point is that as foundations have stepped up their role um, in the crisis, um, there has been some confusion and some question marks about what is the role of foundations and what is the role of the state. We started discussing that this morning, and I think this afternoon it will be important to look at some of the communications aspects of that to make sure that the role of foundations is, is clearly understood. Um, and secondly, as the visibility of foundations uh, during the crisis has increased because of their, their contributions, uh, there are many people in the public, in the media, uh, who, who where foundations and what they do is, is not that clear. Um, and so in some cases, uh, very valuable contributions have been, have been questioned. Um, so before I hand over to the speakers, in advance of us coming together today, the uh, European Foundation Center um, asked some questions in order to get a wider sampling of people who perhaps couldn't be with us today in terms of uh, their perspectives on this. Uh, so they were fairly in-depth interviews with foundations uh, during the uh, Belfast meeting of a few weeks ago. Um, and then also some um, vox pop work done on the streets, um, asking members of the public um, what they understood about foundations. Uh, so the questions that were discussed, is there a role for foundations to play in solving the current financial economic crisis? How can foundations complement rather than replace state efforts? Are foundations tailoring their infrastructure and activities to best help in time of crisis? That was obviously more of a question to foundations than the... Uh, the general public. Um, and then, is there a risk that foundations' contributions will raise questions about in inequalities in the super rich? Again, that's a fairly prompted question to foundations. It wasn't put like that uh, to members of the public. And uh, the EFC has some more detail on this uh, research, which uh, I'm sure they'd be happy to discuss with you. But in just in terms of the time we have um, today, in sort of very general, um, in headline terms, um, I think a few things um, pop out of this. This is just the, the one slide that we'll show. Um, down here, politicians have a role to play in general terms, but we don't have to expect everything from politicians. Um, and I'm actually going to go over here because I can't read this. Um, our role to society is to show that we are here, we are helping, and you can also do the same. You can help each other. Um, and foundations have a big role to play at local level. And why should the foundation sector play a role in the crisis? In my opinion, it's a problem that governments have to take action. So uh, the first couple of communication points that come out is there is a uh, divergence in view, um, whether that's foundations, whether that's the public, about just where does the state stop, uh, where does the, where do, where, where's the role of foundations, and how can, um, as we were discussing this morning, how can um, they work best together and then communicate that working together. Um, and then also, if we, we move on to here, um, foundations are criticized probably because they're not able to prove what they are doing, and we need transparency on where the money comes from, how the money is spent. Um, this would not be the sort of first discussion about 
um, how foundations com uh, communicate their, their activities. Um, but there's a question raised about whether that needs to increase because of the increased visibility. I th I, what I hope is that that sets the um, setting for this afternoon um, with three questions. How is the role of foundations different during a crisis? I think that we had a quite extensive discussion about that this morning, and I'm sure that will continue. So in a sense, that's the overarching question. If we don't address that so much this afternoon and focus on the other two, I think that, that would be OK. Uh, question two, what are the risks in terms of the public's perception and the perception of other stakeholders of foundations at this time? And three, what can or what should foundations do about this? So, so the communications challenge and what some of the, what some of the answers might be. Um, so, to start taking us through this discussion, can I first welcome um, our first speaker, um, who is uh, Nikos Sidakis from the uh, Greek newspaper Katharimi, if I said that correctly. Um, and as I said earlier, Nikos will be um, making his intervention in Greek, so now would be a good time to work out the technology that I will also work out when I go. Nikos, over to you. Good evening. Uh, at first, uh, I want to apologize about uh, speaking in Greek in my intervention. Secondly, I want to thank uh, the Stavros Nyarchos Foundation for uh, the invitation and uh, giving me the chance to speak in uh, uh, an audience of uh, specialists, professionals, scholars, and philanthropists. Uh, third, I want to congratulate this initiative um, about uh, a very critical uh, theme at a very critical point of uh, Greek history, of Greek society. Uh, Greece uh, actually, in my view, faces a human crisis and a crisis of uh, self-confidence and self-esteem. And um, this talking, this conversation, this uh, tank of uh, sentiments and feelings and uh, uh, contemplation will be very useful to all Greek people at this uh, historical uh, phase that is full of uh, pain and full uh, of uh, sentiments that were calling and were searched for our friends. And there are many friends here and out of here and everywhere. Um, I have some points for the theme of uh, for the, this project of this uh, Congress. I want to to remind you some uh, historical elements about um, the Greek tradition of uh, philanthropy. Uh, since uh, the ancient Greece, the Hellenistic uh, era, and the late antiquity, through the great tradition of uh, the great holy fathers of uh, Eastern Orthodox uh, Church, and uh, through them, to our uh, new Greek state since uh, the emerging 19th century and the revolution until our days with uh, our very contemporary tradition of uh, philanthropy and uh, great donors to the state and the Greek people. <coughs> Sorry, I speak in Greek now. So, philanthropy at a time of crisis, from the hero to the saint, from the mekina to the foundation. What is the tradition of benefactors, of philanthropists, uh, and uh, donors uh, 
during modern times. In order for us to understand this tradition, we have to go way back in time. We have to go to the Athenian democracy and then the Hellenistic uh, period, uh, what was done by the descendants of Alexander the Great and what is then reinstated by the Greek Christian fathers of the fourth century, particularly by Saint Basil the Great. Then, of course, we have the lords in the period of Renaissance and then all the way up to modern times. Philanthropy and benefaction are an action which is demanded of the rich. It's something they give back to the rest of society. Saint Basil the Great, uh, reminding us of the gospel, describes philanthropy as eternal life, as eternal glory. And uh, here he mentions uh, what was mentioned by Jesus. So in the Gospel by Matthew, it says, Come, O blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was hot, thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was naked, and you clothed me. Saint Basil the Great is the holy man of late antiquity. He is the saint. He is the person who replaces the hero of ancient Greece. He is the ruler who becomes the connecting tissue or fabric in the emerging Christian world. And this is how he is described by the famous historian Peter Brown. The saint as a hero establishes a balance, a type of uh, cooperation agreement between uh, the uh, holy status of the few and uh, a very great multitude of people. I'm talking about the majority. So we have a balance between the few that were wealthy and the many that were not wealthy. So Saint Basil the Great uh, gave philanthropy both uh, its spiritual nature but also its physical nature. Let's not forget that he established a model philanthropic organization or foundation, the so-called Vasiliada. This was a long, long time ago. So here we see that St. Basil the Great defines the two aspects of philanthropy, and he defines the relationship between the religious and the secular, between spirituality and the material world. And this is why he keeps addressing the rich and says to them, when you draw water from a well, you get water in abundance. But when you leave the well and you don't use it, it runs dry. The same happens with wealth. When wealth is hoarded, it becomes useless. It's stagnant. But when it is used, it becomes more productive and promotes charity. It is great when you receive praise from those who have received benefaction. And uh, the uh, Lord Jesus uh, will be generous to you. So we see that wealth uh, is an accumulation of wealth, but this is in context uh, where the redistribution of power and uh, where uh, competition is uh, not uh, that uh, tough anymore because we have a lot of uh, rituals and ceremonies and gestures. So we see that the wealthy elite always try to, to um, allay fears and to decrease uh, tension by providing uh, a lot to society. This is how, uh, broadly speaking, the tradition of benefaction arose from Hellenistic times to late antiquity all the way to Byzantium, the Florence of the Medici, and from there to modern Greece, the Greece of the great benefactors, Averov, Arsakis, Tositas, Benakis, and many others, all the way up to uh, Carnegie Mellon, Rockefeller, Hearson in the US. So patrons and benefactors give back part of their wealth to the community because that's where it originally came from. Not because they don't uh, want uh, people to feel envious, but also because uh, they want uh, to understand uh, that the biggest competitor of all is death, and they really want to appease death, but also because uh, this gives them strength which is everlasting. 
they will remain indelibly marked in collective memory and they will withstand the test of time. So the more you give back, the more is given to you in return. The more you give, the more you receive. This is something that the Romans knew, something that the Byzantine lords knew, but also Lorenzo Magnifico. So we see that uh, this is good because it leads to decompression. And I'd like to say that this happens when we have a regulatory framework in place, a very strong model of equality, which was the case in the Greek city, in the uh, Roman Republic, but also after the French Revolution in uh, uh, the uh, different republics. So we have this fine balance, but on the other hand, we also have a lot of ambition and on, sometimes we have people hoarding their wealth and they're being not less generous than what they should be. And remember what uh, Peter Brown said about late antiquity and also Paul Van talked about uh, the um, benefaction showed in late antiquity. Now let's move on to modern Greece. Let's talk about modern times. So benefaction as a phenomenon has left an indelible mark in modern Greek history. We had a lot of benefactors who supported the state when uh, Greece uh, won uh, the uh, Greek War of Independence in, 19, in 1821. They built schools, hospitals, orphanages. They actually uh, provided uh, battleships uh, at critical moments. It is with their money that we had the revival of the Olympic Games back in 1896, just three years uh, after the bankruptcy of Greece, because remember what the Greek statesman Charilas Rikupi said, that Greece had gone bankrupt. And maybe now we could uh, take the reverse course. So we could go from Olympic Games of 2004 back in time. And we see that a lot of people made money in 2004 out of the Greek Olympic Games. and. A few years later, the Greek state went bankrupt. Now we're in 2012. Greece is again at a turning point. Uh, it's in a state of emergency. So the geopolitical and social environment is very different from what it was back at the end of the 19th century. So the question is, can we now talk about national benefactors? Are there national benefactors? And if they are there, how do they intervene in the public sphere? The sociologist Basil Karapostolis, who is a professor at the University of um, Athens, uh, talked about uh, historical figures who were able to become donors for their country. In his recent uh, book, uh, which is on politics and on the political ethics, uh, he gives examples of people who actually transcended themselves and they uh, stopped being self-destructive because the Greeks are a self-destructive people. And we see that Greeks always strive uh, to survive, uh, but also to make money. In a recent discussion held with a gentleman, he actually added uh, another um, idea. He said that uh, Greece wants to know whether there are some individuals still out there who do not confuse the idea of a Mykenae with uh, someone who has just grand ideas. In uh, modern uh, Greek history, I'm talking about end of 18th century all the way up to the 20th and 21st century, we can see the following categories of benefaction. I'm talking about national benefaction, social philanthropy, but also private donations and grants in culture, education, research, and health. In the last decades, only money for culture is given and also to health. These are the grants provided. The action of the benefactors for a large monumental public building is no longer the case. I'm talking about large scale projects by national benefactors, but now benefactors are no longer individuals. We have foundations. We don't have individual benefactors. In the past, these benefactors used to give all their money to build something, and then this would be given to the state. Now, the works by the foundations are given to the public and are up for 
common use, for public use, but they run by the foundations more often than not. And sometimes they ask for some money on the part of the state in order for the project to be completed. So there has to be some participation on the part of the state. That's also a difference. Now, we know that we had a lot of national benefactors who were Greeks of the diaspora. Most of their assets were in Russia, in Egypt, in the former Ottoman Empire and in Western Europe. So the symbolic asset, uh, however, the works were always in Greece. Their money was invested in Greece, in their homeland. So we had a very close connection between uh, the Greeks of the diaspora and the national center. So this tradition of national benefactors dating back to the 19th century, well, this is something that is slowly being substituted by the Stavros Niarchos Foundation. And this is done in two ways. So on the one hand, we see that they give something back to the state. And this is the cultural center in Faliron, the uh, project which is very ambitious and this makes us think of the Athens trilogy and we see what happened in the 19th century which made Athens the capital city of the newly founded Greek state but we also have rife symbolism here because we see that the national center is Greece once again so what it wants to do by means of this ambitious project is to make a Greece glorious again so I think this is of dual meaning and and I think that it is very important at this critical time. So we're talking about a time of crisis. Hellenism is uh, being threatened. And the first thing that is now under threat and is already vanishing is the symbolic capital of Greece. We know that the heroes of World War II, the victims of the triple fascist occupation, are being slandered by the mass media of the West, but also by fickle and sometimes uh, malevolent statements by political leaders. For example, we have the German Chancellor Merkel making some comments about uh, the Greeks uh, that died during the Second World War, and the same happened by Mr. Cameron. Last but not least, we know that 100 million euro was uh, given by the Stavros Niarchos Foundation to help the Greeks that are now suffering from the Great Depression. So we're talking about money given to the homeless, to the destitute, to the uh, nouveau pauvre. This is something new. It's a new way of uh, applying philanthropy, active philanthropy. So in this way, the Stavros Niarchos Foundation is not trying to withstand the test of time and to become a living monument. It is not interested in accumulating fame, what it wants to do is to really relieve the suffering of the Greek people. This is love one another, and it's happening hick and nook, here and now. This is what is described by St. Basil the Great, and I quote, the person who is hungry is really suffering. He wanes away. Those who owe money are really suffering. And you postpone charity for tomorrow. Listen to Solomon. Don't just say, go and come back. I'll give you money tomorrow. Because you don't know if this person will be able to come back tomorrow. So you really don't know what's going to happen in the future. So you have to give something directly and you have to do so selflessly. You have to help relieve the suffering of poor people here and now, hick and nunk. And this is something that reminds us of two events during the Second World War, the Greek War Relief Association. This was established in the US in 1941. And the only reason it was that created was to help alleviate the suffering of people in Greece during the Second World War and the Oxman Famine Relief, which was established by uh, British uh, people in 1943 to provide immediate suffering because people were dying. They were starving to death in Greece. And Oxford Committee, this Oxford Committee was the seed, if you like, for the creation of the famous Oxfam, which is such an important organization. Last comment. 
Here we see that tradition is making a comeback and in two ways. On the one hand, we move again towards the tradition of national benefactors of the 19th century, but again, we have the Vasiliada, the uh, charity foundation uh, founded by St. Basil the Great. So people are suffering and this makes us become more active. Thank you very much. Nikos, thank you very much. Uh, without much ado, I pass over to Peter. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, my sincere thanks to the Nyarkos Foundation for inviting me here today. It's really an honor and I'm very proud to be here. Um, I also want to thank Senor Vilar introducing me to horticulture this morning. Muito obrigado, Senor Villar. I'm going to talk a bit about archaeology just for a second. That's one of my favorite rooms in the whole world. It's at the Acropolis Museum. I believe that you were there last night. And when I walk through that room, I feel like I'm walking through the streets of Athens. It's not a museum gallery. It's something much more than that. And it always reminds me of one of my favorite quotes from Plato. Our city is what it is because our citizens are what they are. Makes me kind of agree with Mrs. Thatcher that society ultimately is individuals. That's what the streets of Athens look like today. And it's sad. It's terribly sad. Yes, society needs a safety net. It absolutely needs it but it needs a magnet too. Nikos spoke about this crisis of confidence, the crisis of self-esteem. It needs a magnet. It needs to be pulled upward. This is, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. That to me is worth a million. It was actually taken in 2008 with the death of Grigoropolo, the young kid who was shot in Exarchia. And if you just look at that kid's face, He's not giving up on anything, absolutely nothing. And he will do something about the crisis. You can bet your bottom dollar about that. And this is what he'll probably do. Relocate to Dubai, which has got Jebel Ali Free Zone, Dubai Internet City, Knowledge Village, Academic City, Dubai Media City, etc., etc., etc. Or he might go to Chile, to Santiago, where there's a brilliant government-funded program which offers $40,000, no questions asked, to early startups for them to simply relocate and become part of an innovation ecosystem in Santiago, Chile. Or he might be attracted by that perpetual allure of Silicon Valley, that romantic idea that he might just be the next Stephen Jobs. And if that apple's not attractive, there's the big apple. Where we recently lost a great young innovator, a guy who created a site called uh, Daily Secret, Daily Secret in Athens, which then spread to cities around the world. He's offered funding in New York. Goodbye, baby. He's living in New York. We've just lost a valuable piece of our future. You know the famous song, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. I think we need a remix of that song with Buzukia. Maybe with Remos Osakis Ruvas singing it. Because I tell you something, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. I arrived here from New York 10 years ago. I decided to come and live in Athens. And I went to get my Adia Paramonis, my work permit. And I was told, they yinete. And I said, why? They said, ise elinas, you're a Greek. So I said, well, what do I need to do? They said, well, you have to get an ID card, taftotita. I said, where do I get it from? She said, I don't know. I figured out where to go. I walked into this office, and I said, I'd like an idea, uh, a taftotita. She said to me, they yinete. I said, why? Ise xenos. 
you're a foreigner. So there I was stuck in the middle of this incredible bureaucracy. I think we'd all agree that government systems are somewhat in need of reform. Greece ranks number 100 on ease of doing business, just ahead of Papua New Guinea and just behind Yemen. By the way, those are our closest neighbors in Europe. Italy's not doing too great on 87, by the way. And here's the biggest danger this country faces, the brain drain. The kids with the brains, with the creativity, and the courage, and the vision, will realize their dreams elsewhere. It's one thing to forecast rain, says Mr. Warren Buffett. It's quite another thing to build an ark. I think we can forecast this brain drain. Can we prevent it is the big issue. I'm going to show you an ark, which is a work in progress, something that I'm building together with a lot of other people. And maybe this could be the ark that prevents the brain drain. But before I tell you about that, I need to give you very quickly a run through a very important concept, which is the diffusion of innovation through society. Many of you will, re will, will recognize that curve. It's a normal distribution curve. On the left-hand side, pointer doesn't work, oh, it does. That is 0%, goes up. It reaches 50% in the middle, goes down to 100. Underneath that curve lives all of society. Okay? And what it basically says is that innovation enters on the left-hand side, starts to pick up momentum, and spreads through society. Okay? I'm going to demonstrate that by using an instrument that many of us have, which is the iPhone. iPhones start up with innovators. These are the guys who will line up outside the Apple store for two weeks without knowing what the machine looks like just to have one. They'll go without food to get it. The next group are a little more logical, early adopters. They will say, ah, it has the internet that could be useful. I'll take the risk. I will buy one. They are risk takers. The early adopters go for dinner with their friends, and they show their cool new instrument. And suddenly, the next group wants one. Suddenly, you've gone mainstream. You've really now reached mainstream. That's a big group sitting underneath, underneath that part of the curve. The next group, the neighbor has one. It's time for me to get one. The last group at the end, forget about them. It's like, what is an iPhone? That's where innovation starts. Now, here's the problem. Public institutions live on the right-hand side. Innovation and investment lives on the left-hand side. And in the middle, you've got voters. Okay? And in fact, the guys who are least likely to vote are sitting on the edges. That is the voting body. So it's very difficult for government to move all the way back. In fact, it's impossible. Don't hold your breath. But the reality is that someone is going to have to stick their neck out. Someone has to do it. So here's the concept. This is the arc. Philanthropinerism, I'm getting used to pronouncing it. it. Took me six days to get used to it. What is it? It's a social project whose aim is to facilitate and diffuse innovation and investment, to take it from the beginning of the curve and spread it through society. It does this through partnership with philanthropic foundations, corporate sponsors, and investment funds. It works on the principle of evolution through diffusion to get full public-private partnership. Once you enter the big part of the curve, it's okay for government to get involved. It's not okay at the beginning of the curve. It's too radical. It's a physical space, and this is terribly important. And in this physical space, it's an ecosystem which consists of innovators, the creative community, the thousands of kids who are out of jobs, who've got huge talent, art directors, copywriters, web developers, the people who do things. They do things that the world loves, by the way. 
It's got mentors, it's got advisors, it's got conference facilities, it's got exhibitions. It's an incubator, it's an accelerator. Very importantly, it's a showcase and it provides inspiration to the rest of society. It takes the then yinete word, which by the way means it can't be done, and it cuts off the negative part and it says it can be done through physical evidence. The architecture is built on this principle of cells which encourage productivity and, in, and interaction, which is somewhat like that. So it's inspired by what is inherently Greek. In order to produce something like that. This slide has got some of the most creative workspaces in the world. The Googleplex is on there and various other very creative workspaces. I'm going to show you a very short movie just to show you the power of architecture. The West Coast headquarters of leading global ad agency, TBWA, Shiat Day, opened in 1998 in a large renovated industrial warehouse in Los Angeles. Ten years later, we take a cinematic look at their evolving creative culture. In 1998, the intention was to create a kind of advertising city, a creative village, unifying the 450-person community. In the subsequent 10 years, the agency has doubled in size within the same footprint and remains a vibrant community producing some of the world's greatest creative advertising. For guests coming in the gatehouse, you're surprised as you walk down this tube, you can't see anything, and you step out and it's just this giant space filled with colors and shapes and your line of sight goes all the way to the end of the building. Nothing really interrupts your line of sight, so you, you can see the spaciousness. Um, it's fun to watch people walk in the building. I, you can always tell someone who doesn't work here because they walk around like this. For the first 10 minutes, they're just, they don't even talk, they just look. Uh, you can see them trying to take it in and, and uh, see everything. I think it, it works great in, in terms of uh, uh, the results and the results if you if you look at you know the creativity in terms of awards and and the quality of work that uh, that we're doing uh, I think it really supports that the whole genesis for this space was really uh, more of a advertising city concept and um, you can tell by just looking around the building that it's it's based upon uh, the concept that there, it's a city. And, um, it was really the outgrowth of, uh, I think, a lot of programming that uh, Clive spent a lot of time, you know, just really getting to understand our company, the culture, how we work, um, the environment, and um, and I think all that planning and, and understanding up front paid off. I used to work for that company. I know the power that that had. People would line up to work there. The objective here would have magazines like Monocle. By the way, if Monocle says it's cool, it's cool. Monocle, I'd love to, hear, to see them saying, the rebirth of creativity. This is where we want to work. Monocle reports the Unitep project in Athens. The result of all of this, growth and development through diffusion. By planting the seeds, horticulture, 
and letting them grow through society. What about the brand effect? I'm a branding guy, but I just want to explain quickly what a brand is because I think there's much confusion around this. That's the origin of the word brand. It's how I would distinguish my cattle from yours. I'd put a mark on them. Somewhat like a tattoo, an indelible mark on the skin. Okay? That is not a brand. That's a logo. This is a brand. I don't care if she's got a dragon or a dog or any other kind of animal on her arm. That's the brand. Because brand is reputation. And branding is the process of managing reputation. And everything communicates. Everything you do, and by the way, everything you don't do, everything you say, and everything you don't say. It all communicates. We all have brands. We all have reputations. Some of us manage them. Now, a couple of issues arise with a project of this nature. The political agenda, the profit agenda, the involvement in affairs of state. Somebody spoke earlier on about social media, and social media is the perfect place to deal with issues such as this, with clarity and with transparency, so that society understands the role of foundations. Community engagement is what it's called. And there's a wonderful tool today, which is called social media. Welcome to the conversation economy. It's a dialogue. That's what Facebook looks like. For those who use it, you find friends, you like things, you comment on things, and you share things. Much like the coffee shop. Nothing has changed. Except this is the coffee shop on steroids. So using social media, one can create a web of social media platforms, which, by the way, reaches billions of people around the world. I was about to say millions. It's not. It is literally billions, and feeds them in to the project website for complete clarity and complete explanation and complete branding of what it is that we're doing. I'm going to close with a quote from Richard Branson. The boundaries between work and higher purpose are merging into one, and doing good really is good for business. And I put up the flip side of that, that doing good business really is good for society. Because this morning we spoke about sustainability, and good business is sustainable. Philanthropy. Etymologically, it means a love for humanity. And it takes me right back to the beginning, to my favorite room, with another quote from Plato. At the touch of love, everyone becomes a poet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thomas. Ladies and gentlemen, it's also up to me to say a bunch of thanks to the Stavros Niakos Foundation for inviting me to come here. Um, what I will try is to um, give a few examples for how to manage the progress of um, yeah, creating and maintaining reputation as foundations. Um, that is to talk about rebranding foundations. And my first preliminary remark would be watch out. Form follows function. I suppose the first thing we have to do is uh, to handle or tackle the question to what extent do we have to adapt our project portfolios to the challenges of the current economic and social crisis. That's what I mean when I talk about function of foundations. As regards communications and the branding of foundations, this should happen in a second step. Um, don't lose substance out of sight when you talk about communications. That's rather important. We can also cause a lot of window dressing and create a lot of objections against our work in the broad public um, when rebranding foundations work means window dressing and do not change contents at all. A second point I would like to make is um, 
this question. Um, to what extent do foundations have to change their activities in times of these crises? I'm not even sure whether this is the right question. Um, perhaps we should also ask to what extent do foundations to have to tackle with a different environment due to the crisis? I mentioned that point simply for the reason the longer I thought about our issue today, um, the more questions rose for me and the less answers, to be very honest. One important point which was, I think, also addressed this morning at the panel was, well, you know, we may invest quite a lot of efforts in dealing with the current challenges of the crisis, in helping people particularly affected by the crisis impact, by the social crisis impact. On the other hand, we also run the risk to become part of this short-term crisis management we experience every day as regards political action. That is to say, don't lose out of sight your longer-term projects or your longer-term perspectives. Just to give you an example of what I mean, um, it goes without saying that the rampant youth unemployment in quite a lot particular of particularly southern member states of the European Union is a burning issue we have to deal with. But what we shouldn't do is lose out of sight the impact of demographic change on our societies and the question what to deal with a um, all the time aging workforce. You know, this problem is not out of the world due to increasing youth unemployment. It will impact within a few years in 10 years, we will have to cope with a completely different labor market crisis simply for the reason that you can't do away with demographic change and an aging population. And that is perhaps one of the risks we run when we start to talk about immediate need for action and consequences for the working agenda of foundations. Don't lose off, out of sight the longer term strategic, strategic challenges you have identified for your foundation's work. Um, now let's say me a few words about the issue, how can we change the means in which foundations present themselves and how media portray foundations in times of crisis. Obviously, as regards the media coverage of our work, our influence will remain restricted, whatever we do as regards our communications work. But just a few ideas. My recommendation from a Bertelsmann Stiftung's Foundation's point of view, and admittedly we are a German foundation in Germany, it is, not, is by far not the most affected country by the crisis. For that reason I am talking here in the role of kind of a privileged um, foundation representative. But one re recommendation would perhaps be don't, uh, don't change your vision but adapt your mission and your strategy. What do I mean uh, by saying that? Um, what we have done in the Bertelsmann Stiftung, it goes with, without saying that we have a light build, and it goes without saying that we also have program-specific agendas. But what was missing so far, admittedly, was kind of a connecting link between the specific program agendas we had and this light motif of our work, our vision. That is to say, basically, what was missing in our foundation was kind of a clear mission statement related to specific policy fields. And what we have done in recent months is, in kind of a interactive um, yeah, discussion process, we really involved all our colleagues from the foundation, it's about 300 members of staff we are talking about, to identify those policy fields which are particularly important in times of crisis and we try to make clear in what um, way our different programs contribute to find solutions in these different crisis relevant um, policy fields. This tool, this kind of connecting link, this clearly addressing specific policy fields you are active in with your foundation 
It's also an important tool to clarify and to increase transparency when you communicate with media, quite obviously. That's perhaps the best way to increase their attention or to raise their attention if you try to relate your work to those policy issues featuring high on the political agenda in times of crisis. A second issue I, I would like to address, and perhaps this comes back to Peter's hell of complicated notion of, I try it, philanthropinerism. Yeah. Um, one key lesson we should learn, and as regard this, I, I do perhaps not even perfectly agree with the contribution of Nikos. Don't shy away from political advocacy and from cooperation with other civil society um, organizations. For sure, it's a possibility, particularly for grant giving foundations, to invest quite a lot of money to relieve um, those particularly affected by the crisis from their sufferings. That's true. But if we try it on our own as foundations, that's really only a drop of water into an ocean. What you need is you need some leverages to trigger social investment and to, um, well, also perhaps <clears throat> specific kind of public-private partnerships and even means to encourage private cap uh, capital uh, and, and, and credits, uh, creditors um, um, to give money for social purposes. That's a key function of the foundations and my impression is some way, uh, sometimes that quite a lot of, of grant giving foundations still shy away from doing so since this is to a certain extent regarded as kind of a contradiction to working for the public benefit if you cooperate with for-profit organizations. This is perhaps not the right approach and if you do that kind of advocacy and of joining forces with um, for-profit organizations even to have an impact to have better remedies as regards the social impact of the crisis. This might also contribute to increase media awareness um, of what uh, foundations are doing, and even more important, it will increase public awareness of what foundations are doing to tackle the crisis, I suppose. And the third issue is, perhaps we should also try to highlight that one of our key functions as foundations is to work as kind of cross-border disseminators and incubators of good practice, of the transfer of good practices from other countries. Um, just one other example from our foundation's work, we have a branch in Barcelona. You know about the youth unemployment problems in Spain. And what our Barcelona Fundación Bertelsmann has done so far was a rather, well, let's call it a rather colorful spectrum of activities, starting with the um, funding of libraries and ending with community foundations. What we have done in recent times is we have completely redefined the working agenda of the Fundación Bertelsmann in Barcelona. They only have one topic on the agenda, and this one topic is um, improving job perspectives for young people in Spain. And what they do is they only work for the Spanish market. And the main focus as relates this new um, um, top issue on their agenda, youth unemployment, this single issue on their agenda is to try to find ways how to transfer the um, dual system of vocational training in Germany from Germany to Spain. I think this is an excellent way um, by streamlining agendas, um, also to improve your, your, um, uh, the efficiency of your um, communicative work. Then let's talk about the per perceptions foundations have to tackle or the contradictory perceptions foundations have to tackle with in times of crisis. I suppose there are uh, primarily two different perceptions which are kind of incompatible indeed. As regards political actors, politics, I suppose foundations might be a welcome partner in so far as they, to a certain extent, 
also offer the perspective to get rid of some of the rather expensive social tasks policy makers have to um, cope with every day. And if we want to maintain our social achievements in the uh, European EU member states, I suppose these social tasks will get more and more expensive. And at this point, we really have to be cautious. You know, since we will never be able to substitute the state as social actor, I suppose, we will only be able to complement them. And for that reason, watch out when you talk to political decision makers. Do not kind of arise wrong expectations. And this happens rather rapidly, I suppose. Another problem is, as soon as we step in as foundations and take over public fu functions, particularly in the economic and social field, I suppose we run the risk that there is a growing critical perception from the general public. Since, well, one feature is missing as uh, regards um, foundations, the um, feature of democratic, uh, democratic legitimacy, I suppose. And the more we get active in social and economic crisis-related topics, the more the question will arise in the public, how the hell are you legitimized to take over these tasks? What are your hidden agendas, you know, also as founders, as private um, organizations? And we have to bridge that gap between these two different perceptions, the political perception or expectations on the one side and the public perception on the other side. And how can we do that? And here I come back once again to the issue of Peter's philanthropinerism. Um, um, once again, if there is one strength of foundations, it the strength to be able to work as kind of an intermediary between the different worlds of social investors we have on the one hand, starting from pri private capital um, over public funding to donoring by, by, by foundations and to establish links between social entrepreneurs on the one hand and social investors on the other hand. This is perhaps one field of work that might help us not to step into that trap of contradictory um, perceptions of policymakers on the one hand and the general public on the other hand. That's it so far from my side and I hope we will have a as controversial as possible this debate on the contributions of this panel. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you to all three of you. I think uh, we've had a very wide range um, of, of contributions um, and um, I think you've you've set up some some uh, potential for for some controversy as you as you as you hope. Um, as I look to the room, uh, we're going to operate the same system as this morning. There are two uh, microphones moving up and down the aisles, and so um, if people can indicate by raising their hand if they have questions, we'll probably do the same as this morning. We'll take some. Um, I've seen one over there. We'll uh, we'll take them in groups. Uh, slight difference to this morning, rather than asking each of our three speakers to answer each question, which I think might become rather static, I'll ask, either people can ask one or we'll maybe get two, two speakers uh, to pick up on questions um, and move it around that way. So I can see one question over here. Are there Are there any questions over here? Can we get a microphone over here? Thank you very much. Uh, Peter, thank you very much for your inspiring uh, speech. Uh, I just just a question on that. Um, because I will talk tomorrow about Berlin, the transformation of Berlin, I think I will take on my agenda because that's very similar to what you taught me. Uh, do you see something like that already in Athens, things like that or in Thessaloniki? Because I think this is exactly the direction in which I believe also this hubs and space. Space. You have a lot of empty space here in Athens, for example, I could imagine. 
Um, yeah, well, first of all, mentioning Berlin, perfect. I mean, if you look at what Berlin managed to achieve, it's quite remarkable. And it was precisely through this kind of thinking. Berlin today has become a true creative hub for, not for Germany, for Europe, for the world. Um, there, are, there are a number of, I call them more startup clubs right now in Athens, which are, I think, very well motivated attempts to do the kind of thing that I'm presenting here. But I'm afraid they haven't gone much beyond being startup clubs because it needs true critical mass. It needs, it needs something more than a group of individuals can do on their own. Um, and I think that you know, what I pointed out this morning that in, in my speech a little earlier, it is very difficult for government in this kind of climate to be seen to be supporting what might appear to be a luxury, which in fact is not at all. Um, so, you know, somebody's got to rise up. Corporations, tough. So I think that the whole notion is already there. You can see the seeds of that, to go back to horticulture uh, from Mr. Villar. Um, but there's not enough water, I guess, to go to that analogy. And we need to really create a greenhouse and let these little plants really, really fr uh, flourish and feed them well, which is why I think a bigger scale thing is very necessary. Thank you. Um, other questions? Uh, yes, I can see one at the back. On the left. Yes, my name is uh, Lazarus Papagiorgio, and I am uh, the leader of the uh, Bread and Action Organization, an NGO which is working in Greece since 97. I am really surprised that today I see here only members of the private sector. I have not seen anyone working for the government, whatever government we say. And uh, the effectiveness of the foundation and the NGOs, unfortunately, is depending on laws. In our country, we are not having the support for the people by, uh, for the people who are giving money to this, uh, to the NGOs, to the vo volunteers or whatever. And they are not giving even incentives tax incentives or whatever. I was really uh, very happy to hear that uh, uh, in the previous workshop that one of the government, I don't remember who, in, in Ireland, they are giving incentives to the, don to the donors. Uh, it will be very good, let's say, if someone was about to teach the governments what they have to, to have as a reward if they were putting some incentives to the donors. Uh, I'm sure that uh, the foundations, they have serious problems in transferring their money and that is why they are installing a kind of New York office, Monte Carlo office, or whatever, let's say. Uh, the flow of the money in order to face the crisis, it will be more easy if there were incentives or laws enabling this flow to be more uh, easy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Thomas. Perhaps just a brief remark. You address an issue which is obviously um, one of the reasons why the European Commission has recently presented um, the draft for a European Foundation Statute. And basically, as regards the state of the political debate on that issue in the Council of the European Union, it perfectly reflects what you have just said. Either 
the European statute is featuring extremely low on the political agenda of most member states, particularly on the agenda of the big member states, or um, they, um, well, they are opposed to the statute simply for the reason since this statute includes, for example, tax exemptions for foundations working for the public benefit, the kind of incentives you just addressed in your, in your remark, I suppose. For that reason, um, perhaps this is also the right place to encourage all our foundation partners from other member states of the European Union to do a little advocacy in favor of that European statute with their national governments. That's really urgent, I suppose, if we do not take that opportunity for get about European-wide tax exemptions for our public benefit-related work for the next decades. Thank you. Nikos or Peter, do you want to add anything? No. Take a question over here. There's two questions here next to each other. Good afternoon. My name is Elias Pulias. I'm from the Pulias Foundation in Guatemala. One of the things in our humble experience, in order to actually make a difference, in order to work together, you need the masses. What Peter said, you need the critical mass of Greeks. We here, obviously, we care about the problem. But everybody out there is still asleep. The majority of the Greeks are still asleep. One of the movements in Guatemala is called Despertemos Guatemala 2012. Wake them up. And with one way or another, with, we need the use of the media, Nico. We need the media to be part of this. And we need a marketing campaign which will actually shock the public. We'll wake them up. We do, the majority of the distinguished guests here, do a fantastic job in what we do. But we overlap. We do the same thing sometimes. We don't know each other. But if we get the public involved in our experience, you cannot avoid the government getting involved. If you move 10,000 Greeks to go and live with a family in crisis, in extreme despair, if you move, if one of the big organizations actually gets together, works in a marketing campaign, and involves the media and the Greeks, then this becomes bigger than us. It comes, it, become, it comes out of our hands, and it has to come out of our hands. Because if it's all centralized, if it's all done by the Niarchos Foundation or any other of the Greek foundations, it won't work. If we expect the government to do it, it won't work. If we get the Greeks involved, then this transcends governments, transcends uh, foundations, in my opinion. Uh, I don't know how we can get the media working with us and how this will take the uh, step further. Thank you. Just before, thanks for the qu great question. Just before I come to Nikos, um, I think it's a very good question to the, to the room more generally, which is this question of communication. Uh, we'll hear from Nikos and others as to whether they think that, that more communications is necessary. And then the question to the wider group is, do you see that as a role for foundations, that it beyond the interventions that you're making, there is a role in terms of waking up others and, and being involved in communications. So it would be good to get some responses on that from the wider group while we hear from Nikos and perhaps from Peter. Yeah, please. I agree that um, one of the problems is that uh, Many Greek people are not uh, awakening, but I don't think uh, they don't feel or they don't know. Uh, in my view, most people don't want to see what comes, what is in front of them, because it's very bad, very obscure. Nobody in his life wants to know the bad thing ahead the obscurity. That's the one part. Many people know, but they don't speak. They don't act. The second, media is a tool. It's just a tool, nothing more. 
We cannot activate people. We just can speak to the people. The politics, the political life, the political life will change the people. They must involved to change their life. It's not only about uh, good slogans and uh, good films on YouTube and nice campaigns with nice posters. It's much, much more. It's about the spirit of people, about the morale and the self-esteem. And these things, only the leaders, the real leaders, the spiritual leaders, the intellectuals, the political leaders, the church, every, everything in the real society, in the real world. It's not about advertising or media handling. It's about the very deep soul of the people. Okay. If it is an answer. Thank you. Simon, if I, if I may just add a comment to that. Um, I, I agree completely with you, but with, with a bit of a difference. I have seen, over the past few months, I've seen an incredible awakening amongst Greeks about the problem that they're facing. By the way, I'm talking about Greeks. I'm sure the same applies in any crisis situation. Because the thing that really wakes you up as a human being is when you feel yourself in true danger. It's the strongest motivation we've got because it's life-threatening. It's existential. And there are a lot of Greeks today who are living through existential experiences. Okay? I think that the awakening is happening. And it's happening because the crisis is deepening. The issue is that we, we, we've grown up in a culture which, and it's very sad, this. It's a culture of then yinete. Okay? We don't believe that we can get out of it. There's a crisis of confidence. There's a crisis of self-esteem. There's a crisis of possibility. And this, to me, is the key. As a marketing guy, I would say to you that far stronger than communication is doing things that people like talking about. In other words, to get people to talk about what you're doing as opposed to talking about what you are thinking of doing. Okay? And I think that Greeks today, more than ever before, need evidence that things can be done. Because then they talk about things that are being done and they get up off their asses and they do it. Because you know, as long as you understand that it can be done. So, slightly different take, but I agree with you. Thomas, do you want to add anything? Thomas, do you want to add anything? Quite, quite, quite easy question, I suppose, isn't it? Um, I'm not. I'm not really sure about it. I, I started to think. Well, if if the influence of the media is really as little as described by by Nikos, um, I mean, he is the media expert, not me. Um, quite quite obviously, but um, you know, obviously, my focus is on the development of the more recent German-Greek relationship, which was considerably driven by the media. This goes without saying, I suppose, and. If we're talking about guilt, I suppose both sides have done their part as regards media coverage of the respective partner. Um, to a certain extent, that reminds me of, um, in Germany we say, Brot und Spiele, that is to say, um, bread and games, you know, in the Roman Empire. You just, or, we also call it Bonapartism or Caesarism or whatsoever, simply distracting the public from, from, from the real problems at home by building up a facade, a stage, showing the, the enemy, basically. And this is something which is triggered by the media. For that reason, um, sorry, Nikos, but I do not perfectly agree. And uh, I particularly address the German media. I don't know very much about the media coverage of the crisis um, as, as regards Greek. But as regards to Germany, the media take their part in, in deepening the crisis, I suppose. And that's the least what can be done by the media. 
raising awareness of what's going, home, uh, going on at home and to what extent, to what horrible extent, people are affected by the crisis. Not in Germany, not so far, but we will see. Thank you. Uh, we have a question here and then a question here. We've got a, we've got, going to carry on for a few more minutes, so if other people have got questions, please raise your hands. Um, I'm slightly short-sighted, so there's some people at the back actually helping me, so you can wave to people at the back as well. Hello. This is a question for both Thomas and Nikos. Um, one of the things that we keep coming back to throughout the morning is the role of a foundation versus the state. And uh, what I mean by that is that we keep talking about how much um, can a foundation do in relation to the state? Is this idea of supplementing or replacing the state? And when Nico started talking historically about uh, philanthropy in Greece, it was obvious that a lot of the things that were done by philanthropists over the years, they were substituting clearly the state. There were moments, historical moments, when the state was not able to do certain things. And foundations, philanthropists had to step in and substitute for the state. The trilogy is a clear example of that. Creation of hospitals, of universities, it's also another example. The same happened in the US. The Carnegie gift of public libraries was a clear example of a private foundation substituting for the state. Now, so there are moments when they may be necessary for a foundation to do that. Do you think that we are at a moment like that in Greece today? Do you think there were a historical juncture where the state is failing and it might be essential for a foundation to step in and do a lot of the things that people expect the state to do? Nikos. Yes, um, I, I had some ob observations in my little speech. Uh, I think that uh, in this uh, historical moment, this momentum uh, facing a human crisis in Greece, the foundations, the benefactors, the, the donors, let's say the foundation, uh, can play a double role not only the symbol, uh, fulfilling the symbolic uh, expectations of uh, the Greek people in uh, the beginning of 21st century, but uh, I think the, the most important thing now uh, is to help people to face real life. It's uh, about um, the same with uh, the 19th century, where the benefactors, the national benefactors, the, the foundations, were supporting the Greek state in the symbolic field and with material aid, material help. Uh, now it's, uh, there is a double expectation. And maybe also because of the status of almost failed state in Greece, in some aspects, the foundations maybe can have a better reflex uh, and better perspective, better realization of what the people really need. Maybe they are more flexible and more fast to go down deep in the needs of society and have a better feedback. And this is a very good help for the Greek state to support these uh, structures that are very weak now and will get weaker and weaker in the years to come until the rebound, the regain and the rebirth. I think that the material and moral help to the very weak classes of society is very critical for the foundations now. Nikos, thank you. Do either of you want to pick up on this? 
Um, just let me start with a very basic remark. I, I, I think there is one specific feature of the current crisis that really renders this crisis unique. Since you have a rather um, horrible combination of the crisis and the budgetary restrictions going along with the crisis, and these budgetary restrictions um, even increased by other determinants like I told you about that demographic change on the one hand and growth prospects for the whole industrialized world within the next 10 years at least that are extremely modest. Taking these two factors together, the crisis is unique since it kind of ushers in an area of fiscal restrictions and budgetary consolidation and austerity policies. That's for sure. And that will not be a question of the next one or two years. We are really t talking about a prospect of the next 10 years, perhaps, or even more. Having said this, this also implies if we would like to maintain or to preserve the social achievements, which are also unique in Europe, that we have accomplished as Europeans, you will need a comp complete new model of cost sharing between public authorities on the one hand, private capital on the second hand, and philanthropic funding as thir third big party. And that's why I said, you know, I think perhaps there is one key issue where the foundations, philanthropic donors can play a rather concrete role and this is to improve the measurability of social impact. Since if you can, to some extent, kind of measure the return on social investment, thinking in business categories, quite obviously, you will also manage to get aboard private investors to finance social activities. And who should care apart from foundations? to develop that kind of criteria for social impact assessment. And I mentioned that also due to the fact um, um, that we have been co-funders, for example, for the Social Impact Analysis Association, um, an international network of people dealing with that issue. We simply think this is key to get aboard also private investors. We can't in any way if you take together the capital and, and, and the grants of all European uh, foundations, and even the US included, we wouldn't be able, as foundations on our own, to take social responsibility by grant making to a considerable extent. That will not work. We need that kind of other social investors and, 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 and yeah sorry to say this, but also of, of social business. And what, 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 what is perhaps a reason for some hope, it's still rather modest, but also at the European Union level, they are starting to think within the social business initiative about what kind of instruments could we think about to um, increase attractiveness of social investment for private investors. Seconds. Please go ahead. I, I just want to endorse completely what, what, uh, what Thomas has just said. I think that broad partnerships are completely, absolutely necessary. Absolutely necessary. Fortunately, the corporate world has learned a little word called CSR. CSR has been a little showcase of how good I am, right? So I think that opens up huge, huge opportunities. I think that it's, it's got to be a very broad coalition of anybody in society who can bring power to bear with their own in their own specialized way, should bring power to bear. Thank you. We have a question up here at the back, and then if we can get a uh, microphone to Jerry. Okay. Uh, this question goes uh, to Mr. Xidakis. Uh, the role of the media in this kind of job that we are discussing now. Uh, we, in NGOs, we are giving many interviews to newspapers and TV uh, stations. The questions that we are 
answering um, shows that the media wants from us a story. And according to these times, a sad story. This is not good. Because, first of all, we are tired. Our job is not sad. We are very happy of doing this. And what we are doing is a message to the society, which can be like this. More charity, less crime. Because this is true. More charity means that you participate in making the world better. These general messages are much more better, are much more, more true, are much more received by the public. I would advise, I would suggest, I would ask from the newspapers, and Kathy Merini is that one of the newspapers that I respect very much, it is one of the best in Greece, to take this uh, comment in your agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nikos, do you want to respond to? Yes, I don't have uh, something to answer. Just a little, a very small observation, remark, that uh, sometimes we think that uh, the media, the communication, is much more stronger than there really is. Uh, I think communication in this very situation that we live here, and in Greece, much more than the rest of Europe, but the whole Europe is in crisis, and the whole political situation and the whole communication landscape and the contemplative and the thinking space in Europe is in, in crisis and in decline. I want to say that communication is a, to give a moral stimulation to the people. It's not to guide them. I think that there are other uh, organizations in the civil society that can do that. I think that some of our sufferings in the European civilization, in the Western civilization, is from the overdose of communication, of the overdose of media. It's too much communication and no communion, no compassion. There was too much media all these last one or two decades. Everything was media. And where is compassion? Where is society? I think that we have to, to see things again. What is uh, media? What is social media? What is community media? What is the communication in the communities and between the communities? The communication between the, leader, the leaders and the people? The leaders if I see from the Greek example, work communicating and not making policies. They are in the TV channels, not in their offices, late at night, work hard. So, media is the leadership. If it is, it's very bad for our society. Thank you very much. Jerry. Okay, I, I really wanted to, to talk about rebranding again because, um, and I don't want to sound controversial. I'm, I've been thinking about this for some time and I'm going to say something that might offend, but I uh, don't mean to offend anybody. Um, one of the problems we have in the world is the expert brigades that have instant answers and know all the solutions to problems. And we've seen in other parts of the world sometimes when countries have to go through structural adjustment programs. The real problem of misdiagnosis and uh, an obsession essentially with the experts pronouncing that they know how to solve the problem 
and then uh, giving people essentially a, a, a cure that's, that's uh, not exactly digestible. And we've seen this in the world, but the places where the lessons have been learned best are in places in Africa. And the question really I have is, would people be willing to learn lessons from where structural adjustment programs have been badly managed, badly put across, badly diagnosed, badly dealt with? And is there a readiness to look at that, or is it something that is too complicated for people to digest? And then on this issue of the media, I think Absolutely. The fact that we have essentially leadership responding to questions and forever having to find a way. I mean, I'm watching the Euro crisis recently has been really instructive in how little time there is for serious, quiet, behind the scenes thinking to take place. Because so much has to be done in, in, the, you know, in the full glare of a very uh, one-off media that's not happy with the answer it got five minutes ago, it needs a new answer every 10 or, 10 or 12 minutes. And this is, I think, one of the problems we are facing. But I'm throwing these out as just observations. So I want to pick up on this. Peter? Uh, yeah. You know, I think, first of all, learning, learning lessons, wow, could not agree more. Uh, is there a willingness always to learn? No, there isn't. Um, I happen to, I'm South African, I lived through a dramatic restructuring of that country, which was remarkably good. There's a great African example right there. And some of the things that they did were radical. But, you know, they, they, they took a society from one place into another place and remarkably well. Um, just a comment on, 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 on the media. You know, and here I'm going to talk a bit about what Nico said as well. Yes, we do overconsume media in my opinion. And yes, media does oversell itself. And, and media oversells itself by, by, obviously, by selling dramatic stories, because dramatic stories are far more attractive to us as human beings than not so dramatic stories. We love hearing about things that are on the edge, things that threaten us, which is why the bad news sells so well. And I saw a remarkably honest bit of journalism by a fellow called um, Barnaby Phillips from Al Jazeera, where he spoke about this. And he spoke about the armies of people who've descended, who used to be war zone correspondents in the Balkans, now in Athens, waiting for the next incident to happen. And hoping that it happens, frankly. Because as he puts it, the news machine is a voracious beast, and you have to keep on feeding it. And maybe Nikos is right, that beast has become just a touch too big. Thank you. We have two final questions. First one here, and then the second one here. Thank you. Or comments. Thank you very much. I'm Father Thomas Sinodinos from the Archdiocese of Athens. And I would uh, please ask you to permit me to talk in Greek, as I am afraid that my bad English will not express what I want to say. Please. OK? Thank you. Um, First of all, I would like to thank you for your invitation to this wonderful event. I would like to thank the EFC and, of course, our speakers. I was quite impressed by the speech made by Mr. Xidakis. He explained what real philanthropy is and how this notion has evolved since ancient times, going all the way down to the Byzantium and modernity. After this discussion, I would like to focus on two words. First, awareness raising or awakening, and secondly, the role of the mass media. Let me start from the second. I believe that the mass media play a very important role in the lives of the Greeks today, and I believe that they can play a beneficial role as regards real crisis, because in my view and in the view of our church, this crisis is not a crisis that has to do with the per capita income or unemployment and so on and so forth. Of course, it is all this, but it's also a spiritual crisis. 
and I believe that the media can play a very important role in this by supporting the people, not just by informing the people. Now, as regards awakening mentioned by Elias, and I think it is very important what you said, Elias, it's really important. There are many agencies in Greece that they can be aware, that can awake people. And such an agency is the church. The church is doing this as far as possible. Many times we do it in an amateur way because we don't have the know-how or the necessary knowledge to be better in this. And maybe you could help us, could assist us with your knowledge. It is well known that the church tries to support the poorest segments of the people either with uh, food or anyway, I don't w uh, want to dwell on what we are doing. Everybody knows what the church is doing anyway. I would like to say that um, we would like to thank the various foundations in Greece and in other countries because they have supported the work of the church. Many. Uh, they have supported our work, and they seem to believe that the church is trustworthy and uh, that uh, we can operate in such a way as to help the afflicted Greek people. I think that the church can awake people, and it can do something else which is not widely known. It can be supportive. There is a phenomenon which hasn't been mentioned yet. And maybe this is the worst phenomenon of the crisis. This has to do with suicides. Yesterday, a hundred meters away from my office, a young person of 42 years killed himself. I'm sure that if there was somebody to help him, to take him by the hand and assist him, he wouldn't do it. There are many such uh, cases. And we have been helping people with uh, our words uh, and with various other activities. So please support the role of the church. We want support from uh, the media, Mr. Xidakis. Uh, please help us from your position. Uh, we want support from the foundations as well. Because uh, everybody is awake except the politicians. and. Uh, I, this is a pity. It seems that the only people who haven't realized the situation yet are the politicians. And we have to speak the language of truth. The state isn't assisting us. And as mentioned before by a colleague from a foundation, we have bureaucracy, we have heavy taxation for the church. This wasn't so in the past. We cannot fully utilize the assets of the church to use these assets for the benefit of the community. These things have to be said. And I hope that this conference will become a forum. And we will have the opportunity to mention all these things. We want to do things in the best possible way, and we want to cooperate and understand each other. The assisted agents or agencies such as the churches, together with the foundations that offer their support. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Would anyone like to make any comments? Maybe we'll just take one last uh, comment or question. Yeah, just a, a very quick. Go on. Just a very quick comment. We talk about the role <coughs> of philanthropy, and I think it's important. You know, we learn early on in life not to underestimate people or situations. I think at the same time we should learn not to overestimate. And I think we should be very careful that all of us we don't overestimate the role that the foundations can actually play. Uh, foundations on their own, at the end of the day, cannot do anything, no matter how, money, how much money they have. They can, they can play a part, a big part. In the short term, they can sort of 
to replace the state, but it has to be on, on a very focused uh, uh, model. And, uh, and so just a comment. I think we have to be careful that, that we don't overestimate what we should be doing and, and more important, what we can be, be doing because we do have our limits. And I think we have to be careful that we remain a positive force and we can link in many ways. We can link private and public. But I think at this point, uh, as Father Thomas said, both the state and the private, they have to wake up also and do their, their share, whether it's called policy, whether it's called leadership, common sense, morality, paying taxes, etc., etc. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, it's 20 past four. I'm going to, uh, I'm getting a, a vigorous nod from Linnea, so I'm going to draw the, uh, the session to a close. Um, I just say two things. One, uh, f for me, I was thinking earlier about how one would sum this up, but I think we've heard so many different perspectives and so many strands of thinking this afternoon that certainly for me it will take me well into tomorrow to, to reflect on what's been said and what those strands are. Um, the, the one that really immediately strikes me um, is this point about the material and the symbolic and about morale um, that uh, we were talk we keep coming back to the horticulture point, um, but it sounds like the horticulture point is not only a, a material thing, um, but there could really be a... Um, it's important for the foundations uh, to see a, um, an opportunity to... Uh, to, to, to by, by, by their actions to communicate to hope and, and morale. Um, so I will, I will leave that. Can I just check we're going to take half an hour? Is that the... After the coffee break. So we take half an hour for coffee break. We take half, we take half an hour actually because you're running rather late, but we can meet again at 4.45. Perfect. So we meet back here after the coffee break at 4.45. Thank you very much. And the coffee break is right outside this room. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you to our speakers this afternoon.